We'll call the meeting to order. Is there anything that needs to be amended to the agenda or are we good to approve as written? I'm good. Looks good to me. Yep, I'm good. All set. <clears throat> okay, I just need a motion. Motion to uh, approve the agenda as written. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Oh, there we go. Great. Right on time. All right, Alex, you're first. Right on time. Just you, <laughs> yeah, just, just as you walked in, man. I just put in the packet the map that you guys have had for a long time. So yeah. just. Yeah, this is where we're about to We're looking to use the same section of the road, class four, class three road crossings that we've been using for years. Nothing's really changed. Did you have any issues last year? I, mean, I didn't hear. Nobody yeah, called. We didn't have a lot of snow. Yeah, nobody <laughs> called. We didn't have, I mean, I've talked to you in the past when we've had. We worked pretty hard to get the trails put back together. Yeah. The road put back together. You know, Davis Road pretty hard. Yeah, did bad. Yeah, that one little one. It's a lot of water in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. And then, uh, yeah, I didn't really get to enjoy it all that much. But hey. There's always this year. <laughs> That's right. There you go. We'll have Therese get right on that snow thing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. You're next, next on my purse. Get a snow machine. That's right. At least we got to drive the river somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You can ride the road. There you go. Yeah. That April storm, late March, early April storm. At least we got to drive Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I hadn't heard anything. I know that um, VASA, right, they're the ATV guys, have had some different issues with landowner changes and stuff, but nothing that's really affected you? Nothing, nothing that I know of. So oh, good. Far, so I think we're... Great. We've been in a whirlwind of trail work here the last few weeks. Trail it, work, machine work. Yep. On the tracks, on the machines. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, just finished, finished your work today. So. Okay. Well. Way up on water on, on the top of the up there. But yeah. At this point, we're way over our machine hours for what? Yep. Plan, so. Yeah, it's understandable. You may wait till spring. <laughs> there you go. All right. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Julie, it was Jordan and Denise. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Tom, you got a little bit, but you want to go 10 minutes early? You sure. good with speeding along? Sure. <laughs> um, I've prepared a few remarks. Uh, my name is Tom Burgos, I'm in Bethel. Representative, I've been in that position for 10 years. And throughout that time, I've been on the state coach for the directors, the Tri Valley Transit Board of Directors, and I'm currently the treasurer. I'm also a volunteer driver. Um, I'm also here with Mike Reader and Bill Hall, so you guys want to introduce yourselves. So, I'm Mike Reader, I'm the Community Relations Manager for the Orange and Northern Windsor Region of Tri Valley Transit, which was formerly state. I'm the uh, representative to the Orange Northern Reserve Regional Committee that advises the uh, consults with the, uh, the board of directors. Okay. Well, thank you both for your service to Bethel. We appreciate it. You guys ha are in the know, have all the history, so that's great. Thank you. You're well, we're here today to discuss next year's funding appropriation request for Tri Valley Transit. And considering the size of the requested amount and the infrastructure nature of the services provided, we're asking to have the request added to the morning for town meeting as a separate article, instead of included within the Human Services Advisory Board recommendation as it has been done in the past. In order to help explain our request, I would like to first outline how our finances work. 
Some of this was shared earlier in the letter that we received in, in prior discussions. Um, that were, uh, so TPT is, a, is approximately a $7 million organization that runs on a break-even budget. TPT's revenues come from a 20 split between government grant sources and local funds. Um, Stagecoaches, government funds um, require a 20% match. So for every $1 of local funds, we can pull down $4 of grant funds. These local funds are essential to allow us to do that. Of the local funds that we try to attain, Stagecoach seeks one quarter of them from the municipalities that it serves. So that's approximately 5% of our budget. Stagecoach takes responsibility for raising the remainder of the local funds from institutions that we serve, such as Dartmouth, Gifford, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, Sharon Academy, Millbury College, and School District. Stagecoach has developed a fair share formula that is intended to distribute that 5% fairly and equitably among That's the maybe their current municipalities in the Stagecoach service area. The distribution is based on total population, the transit dependent population, and the level of service that Stagecoach provides. We're working with all towns in our region to incrementally bring them closer to their fair share in order to get Bethel to the fair share amount of $7,600, we, we decided to ask for that increase over two years. $1,800 was voted in last year at town meeting, and we're seeking $1,800 this year. Okay, so you went from four thousand to fifty-eight hundred. Now you're going to go from you want to go from fifty-eight to seventy-six, right? Seventy-six. Yeah, that's what I thought was that you guys that there was like a gradual to get there. Years. Yep, nice. Okay. And the letter references a number slightly higher than that, but for the sake of what we viewed at town meeting last year, we're going to stick to eighteen hundred. Okay. Okay. Oh. And as. As Therese said before that, our last increase was in 2019. These funds are critical to support the service that is used regularly by the Bethel residents. Last year, 2,500 riders boarded buses and stops in Bethel, and 1,800 people used the volunteer driver dial ride service. Many townspeople are using public transportation for rides to the hospital, to medical appointments, pharmacies, grocery stores, shopping centers, senior centers, schools, and their workplace. Stops that serve Bethel include the school, White Church, Depot Apartments, the Town Hall parking lot, and the Exit 3 parking lot. This system helps connect our Upper Valley communities from Bethel to Hancock to Chelsea, to Rochester to Randolph to White River Junction and West Lebanon. So it's vital. CBT is a local nonprofit that provides safe and dependable transportation across Orange, Northern, Windsor, and Addison counties and has served local residents for nearly 50 years, providing over 5 million rides since it started. It's an efficiently run organization that manages its services and its money very well. We think this is a valuable service and we are asking for local support. Therefore, we propose following through on part two of last year's plan to bring Bethel's appropriation to its fair share level with an increase of $1,800. So we'd like to know what our next steps are. And we're open for discussion too. So I think um, what we were talking about a little bit at the last meeting, um, you know, so the, historically the, the route for human services has been, you know, how we have done it for years, which is to go through the human services committee, you know, by letter identifying what the need is. And then the committee takes that information and uh, through, you know, some direction of the board and makes decisions based upon 
the need, you know, maybe you get everything you want, maybe you don't get everything you want, or, or maybe the add people, maybe delete people based upon usages, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that we saw last year that was unprecedented for our community was that, you know, we typically operate, you know, since I've been on the board anyways, and I came on, you know, right around when Bill was getting off, and, you know, we had a budget at that point of around $20,000. So we had a $20,000 human services budget that, you know, I, I would say probably 10 to 12 identities shared that pool of money. And it, and it kind of gradually has increased over time up until prior to last year of us being somewhere in the $27,000, $28,000. Um, so it kind of grows at like a 3% a year type margin. And then last year, all of a sudden we had, you know, huge increases in needs from different either existing um, organizations or new organizations that, um, that were requesting money. So like, you know, one request, for instance, last year was actually larger than our entire budget, or our entire human services budget. Um, and then we had several existing organizations that increased by way greater than, you know, I mean, we've never really gotten to maybe what our fair share is, right? We've been trying that for years, but you know, it, was, it grew at a substantial rate. So last year we made some decisions as a board to either increase some inside the budget that we had or, and or in some cases, some people did get some money in the budget, asked for some extra money on the warning, or in some cases on a larger one, asked for the entirety on the warning. So those were kind of the, um, pieces we went and we were talking about the last meeting is kind of how does that human services piece for Bethel look going forward like it worked well for many years but now it's just it's grown by two and a half times so you know is this something that you know the uh, select board wants to continue to say okay you know we feel that 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 townspeople can afford a certain dollar amount that we will do inside the Human Services Committee, or do we start putting more things on the warning because they are, the costs are, you know, quite a bit more. So I don't think we, we haven't, as a, yet, we haven't answered that um, question. Uh, we did have some ed, um, folks that were here through the food bank at the last meeting uh, that we're kind of getting some direction on which way they need to go because you know if, if we do decide to let's say not grant the full entirety we need to allow them um, ample time to be able to get themselves on the warning right so um, so I, I not speak for the board but we we kind of really just kind of started our discussions on exactly where we think this is gonna go. Um, we are just starting budget season, so budget season is, you know, kind of going to officially open at our next meeting, right? Mm -hmm. um, where we start looking at, you know, some of the lower line fruit of the budgets that are easier to get through. And, and I think at that time, we'll be, you know, starting to talk a little more into, you know, what the human services piece is looking like. Um, and, and, and then, maybe at that time making some recommendations to certain folks on, you know, and maybe it doesn't look like it might get in the budget, so you might wanna, you know, go about getting it on the warning. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have an exact answer for you today, but we do know that um, you are one of three, three, three human services that we have identified as that are in that bracket of are we going to be able to fit you into the human services or and or should we go to petition on it? Um, so there's basically through you guys have three options. You can either include them in the budget, you can make them petition, or you can just agree to put them as an article, a separate article on the warning just right. like WARVA. Yep. And it's not they're asking for the third to be on the warning just like WARVA. So um, it'll be easier for you to just set a precedent, or I think, just to say this is what we're going to do. I mean, let's face it, petitioning, they will get whatever they want petitioning. Let's face it, everybody loves Tri-Valley Transit, so they're going to get whatever they petition for. Mm. So in some cases, you know, since they're willing to say 7800 they had got half last year to get us to where we need to be contribution-wise, you know, yeah. then it does really fall to the voter at that point, you know, what happens. So.
You do have a couple of options. Yeah. It, yeah. How do you calculate your ridership? I'm just curious because you like obviously if you pick people up in Bethel, it doesn't necessarily mean they live in Bethel, right? So do you? Is there even a mechanism for? Figuring out where people are really from? Yeah, it's challenging. I would imagine. <laughs> what, what we do, when we look at our dialogue program, so we tours. Right, those are, yeah. Those, those trips we look at, we do have the residency on file for that person. So, yeah. So every trip they get is attributed to the town where they live. Mm -hmm. uh, for bus ridership, you know, the, the bus is a public, uh, public service, it's out there. Uh, what we look at is boardings in the town. Uh, so, uh, so we look at those those stops that serve serve Bethel uh, Bethel residents, and and look at those boardings. So it's a it's a guesstimate, mm -hmm. um, but we figure it's a pretty good shot that people getting on the bus at those stops are uh, are from Bethel. Some of those borderline uh, exit three park and ride. You know, I'm sure we're drawing some from uh, from Royalton, but uh, but uh, you know that was kind of our, our move. We retained that white church stop, but uh, but that was our real move from having that main stop at white church going to the to the park and ride. Let people not drive through town, back and backtracking on the bus has been a nice uh, a nice addition there, and that's what a lot of our is doing. <coughs> So I was just curious because I know it's, you know, we talked about this at the last meeting about how sometimes people are going to get counted twice, right? If they go to the food shelf and they go to the senior center and they go to, you know, someone else to get another service, uh, you're still serving people. You're just serving the same person. So we were just, I was just curious because. Yeah, that's, that's the other piece that we track rides, not individuals. Right. Um, you know, the, the dial ride service, we could break that down to the numbers of individuals that are served. But we also find that that can fluctuate so much year to year. Uh, you know, I think you know, Tom would attest as a, as a volunteer driver, you know, you might be bringing someone to a, to a kidney dialysis uh, uh, services three days a week. Um, you know, if their health condition changes, you know, you may, you may not be bringing them. In. Right, so, right, and that's a good so point. So those rides that really, really pile up uh, in, a, in a week, a month, a year, uh, could change, change greatly from year to year. So actually, when we look at those dial right now, is we do take a four-year rolling average. We figure that kind of evens out the uh, you know the peaks and valleys of, of the individual needs. Sure, I think that makes sense. And, and does the ride numbers, like I know we have some overlapping things in the town of Bethel now, I want to say that is, you know, most recently in the last two years, maybe three almost now, is, um, you know, there, there's been some new routes that have been installed for like going from campus to campus for, for school, yeah. which I know the school pays separately for. Mm -hmm. So does, when you talk about Bethel ridership, does that include the school ones as well? It does include that, and, and um, uh, just to clarify, the, the district doesn't pay for that as a separate service, they're another donor. Uh, we're not, we don't so much have a, have a um, contractual relationship with them, it's more that, you know, we've added that as a stop because we have, a, you know, young people are transit dependent, it's going to be a, a use of the service there, and the district, as a partner, uh, provides funds to, to support the overall, uh, overall transit system. Much like uh, Tom mentioned Dartmouth College, uh, in our Addison Region Middlebury College, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, different medical center, uh, you know, kind, of, kind of pay into that pool as another source alongside the municipalities. So they're basically giving you a, an appropriation and not a per ridal rider fee. Exactly. Right. Okay. Great. Well, it makes it easier to count on that money each year for when you're doing a budget, for sure. Yeah, that's, you know, we're looking for a diverse, uh, diverse range of, of income sources there. We certainly recognize the financial pressures on, on you know, towns in our service area and don't want to, uh, you know, could never rely on towns to come up with that entire 20% match. So looking at other, other sources, we've done really well over here with, uh, you know, with other institutional partners to support the, the, uh, the service. Good. 
And, and I know we and we talked about the board meeting the last time, and it's, it's probably no shock to anybody in the room. But you know, the, the last couple of years, I mean, the cost of everything has gone up. Um, and and you know what's interesting is you know the the average response to taxpayers in our community seem to be, you know, um, voting everything in on town meeting day, but then be shocked when the bill comes. And you know, and it's not to say that you know we're trying to make decisions in everybody's best interest, but at the same time we have, you know, very like we saw last year. I mean, we had. You know, we went to budget with a, f a three cent increase um, for the town and we left town meeting with a 10 cent increase. And, it, and people instantly, you know, voted in seven cents worth of all these extras and then went home and said, what, the school's not going up at all? Well, we better partition that because that's not right. That, that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you know, so we have this like challenge inside right now that, we're so easy, you know, on the floor to vote everybody in because nobody really wants to have that tough conversation or say a nay vote. But then they go home three months later and get their new tax bill and go, oh, my taxes went up $300 for the year, you know? And, and I can't afford this and I can't afford that. But they're so easy to just vote stuff at town meeting day. Um, and I think that's the challenge we have as a board is, we're trying to put forward a, a um, responsible um, budget that we see for individuals. And then, like we did last year, is if you want these other services that maybe we either didn't offer before or now want additional monies that you're going to have to vote those in. So at least there's some, I guess, responsibility there for down the road. But um, it's been, you know, mixed mixed uh, reviews when it comes to you know, how that's been getting done. Um, so I, I think that's kind of what we at the board have to figure out what we want to do is uh, on these things is, you know, are we going to put them in the budget? Are we going to make people vote on them? I mean, I know we're trying to not be a, you know, some of those uh, municipalities that have three pages of things to do on town meeting day, you know, there's, you know, 20 line items of, you know, appropriate this and appropriate that, and appropriate, you know, because a lot of people just get sick of it and they're like, yeah, whatever. I mean, either they're not voting, they leave, or they raise their hand and everything just to get out of there. So mm. um, so it sounds like with the, the this additional $1,800, which would bring you to $7,600, now what, what is their, our forecast for the next three years look like? Most likely just inflation rate, cost of Minor. This is for catching up, I don't know. Two years worth of yeah, years of avoidance. Right. Okay. It would be fairly, fairly steady, um, low increases after that, if at all. I mean, maybe it would go several years without an increase. It's just an office budget increase here for TDT. Yeah. Well, I certainly, I, I had met with Tom last year and, and uh, briefly and someone else with you, I forget. Oh, was it Mike? I was like, somebody was with you, right? And we talked about that and, and I've seen that done in other towns where you kind of, okay, we need to be here, but they were gracious enough. They couldn't, they knew we couldn't get there all in one year. So to kind of break it up over two years. And so um, I certainly appreciate that approach and that you worked that out with the human services board last year. So. Well, especially since the, the rate was calculated on a four-year average. You know, and the impact from year to year would be even, even less um, because it's all averaged out. So, right. you know, next year's request, if there is, you know, whatever the change would be, would have to be minor because it's all averaged out. Oh, great. So, yeah, that's, that's great. Good news. So, so it sounds like, um, I don't know what, uh, what's, is, what's our meeting? Day? Day? Yeah, there's really only a couple of options. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, um, the petition, like you say, is probably a guarantee. That's just the way it seems to happen at the town meetings. Mm -hmm. um, separating them out, you know, as a separate item to be dealt with similar to Warva, um, relieves them having to do the, you know, the, uh, going out and getting signatures and all that every year. Um, it seems like they're a, a, a service that's going to continue to grow in the area. 
uh, not like I think they're going to be leaving next next year or anytime soon. So it, no, I can't really, you know, I've, I've mentioned to you what the Human Services Committee feeling is on on the subject, and I guess I have to stick with that, you know, feeling of the group. Um, so I guess it's just a question of whether or not we want to put them on as a separate warning item on a regular basis, like Barbara, or um, or deal with it some some way else. You know, I don't know what that way would be, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. What's the rest of the board's opinion? What do they think? I mean, the last year when we talked about it as a, as a human services group, uh, the, we had the same request. I'm really actually thought that this year's request might be even more, you know, we given another year pass, I mean, more ridership and more growth. Um, and we, you know, you had met with Tom and we talked about it as a, as a committee and figured halfway now and maybe halfway uh, this coming year to try to get to that point. Um, so I think that's where we're at. Do we, do we feel comfortable as a... Can I ask a question first? Sure. You're talking about ridership. Are you, are your routes added or changed or whatever? Or I guess my best question is, is the bus full? Uh, we're, 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 we've been steadily increasing ridership since, uh, since COVID. Uh, you know, we're, uh, how many, how many riders are in each bus? I don't know that off the top of my head, but we'll say our routes are designed a lot around our partners and, and their needs. Um, Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock Medical Center has a, a fairly early ship, so we have a, a route that hits, uh, hits 11, uh, 7, 30, 7 o'clock in the morning, so, that, so those uh, folks can get to work. Our later, uh, our later run in the morning is geared more towards the uh, more towards the schools, where we serve the uh, students going to Sharon Academy and to Toronto <coughs> High School. Uh, so the riders are are spread kind of evenly through those uh, through those routes. Okay, that that's <coughs> not where I was going. Where I was going with it is if you're not adding routes. Mm -hmm. You're not, your buses aren't full. Those expenses to drive your budget up, other than cost of living, would be more buses, more drivers, whatever. And you, it sounds like you're not really doing any of that. Correct. So that, that just goes to, along with Tom's thing about the modest increases. Once, you, once we get to this point, the point that you're talking about is where everybody's doing their fair share, yeah. from then on, until you change routes or demand that you have to have more buses and drivers, that should continue to go down the road that way. Right. Correct? Okay. Yeah, and that, the busyness of the routes is monitored at a state level very closely. And they're fairly tolerant about uh, meeting a standard, both the cost uh, standard and then usage standard. And if it doesn't meet that standard after you know, maybe two or three years, they're going to discontinue the group. So it's, it's monitored uh, at a higher level than just us. And we have people, we have a committee within, under the board of directors called the Operations Committee, that evaluates and helps. These are local people on the committee that help us make decisions relative to Starting a new route, discontinuing a new route, maybe changing some stops. So there is some local input on the route system as well. Do you know how much the school donates off the top of your head? Uh, Roughly? Not the exact figure, it's in the $30,000 range. Okay. Tom, how do you guys apply the same formula to all the towns that you deal with? Yes. From Middlebury to Lebanon to every point in between? It's 50 towns and, and quite a spreadsheet, yes. <laughs> but you go to the select boards of each town or you, get, you try to get on the budgets of each town for appropriations? 
Yeah, each town has a different process. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, part of that effort is, is working within, uh, within each town's uh, individual process, much like you guys are deciding how to, how to handle that this year. Um, and, it, and it's all over the board from, you know, filling out, you know, just sending in a, a letter to the, to the town treasurer, to petitioning, to applications, uh, you know, all, all towns seem to have a traditional way of approaching this. If you're asking me, I'd say we put them on the, uh, an article as we do in the board room. Well, I was going to say at this point, I mean, we still have some decisions to make during the budget season, but it's, it sounds like through the, you know, through the board that it's safe to say that if we don't put it in the budget, then we would put it on the warning for you. So we'll and that's the right. Is that, does that sound Perfect. appropriate for the board? Yep. That way you won't have to worry about petitioning. So one way or another, if we don't fit it in, then we'll put a separate warning item for you, if that works. So. And if we are separate warning, then we'll have to craft some language to it <coughs> into the town report. The warning um, you'll be able to put in, you know, send some information just like you normally do. You'll be able to do that. And then it would just make sense um, to have someone there to speak to the article in case people have questions. Yeah, I think you've done that before, Tom. We yeah. had a few years ago. And, um, yeah. Okay. Anything so further? It sounds like you don't have to petition, so that's good. <laughs> Be out in the rain and snow and sleet, getting your signatures. <laughs> uh, just to clarify, so you're saying you don't, you're not the 7684, you're just 7600, or yes. okay, all right, I'll just correct. That. All right, we'll just correct that. <clears throat> Perfect. I mean, it's, watch this. I'm gonna split hairs. I just wanted to be accurate. <laughs> All right, anything further on that? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks very much. And for your service. Thanks for your support. <laughs> All right, so we made it through our two appointments, uh, open it up for public comment. So if there's anything that's not on the agenda that you'd like to share, bring up, or make comment on, now would be the time. I don't see anybody online, so I'll just take anybody that's in person. I was just going to share that the follow-up meeting for the community conversation about common safety is tomorrow here at 5.30 and 7.30. Um, we'll just be going over, yeah, going over the, the stuff and compiling yeah. and coming up with some things and then we'll get that um, the 24th, 25th. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Fifth, right? Because it'd be 14 days from today. Yeah. So I heard a lot of positive. I didn't hear a negative thing about no, any of your meetings. A couple little instances, but overall it was generally a very positive conversation. That's great. Good. Yeah. That's excellent. All right. Anything else? Anybody? All right. Hearing none, we'll <clears throat> close public comment. And first agenda item that we have is the Bethel Fire Department's qualifications for officer positions. Um, All right, so Gary sent me this, and then we had, then I had sent him any edits or ideas that I had or questions. And um, so basically, in a nutshell, what's going to happen is the fire department will conduct a vote on available positions the first meeting in february every two years and what's going to happen is <clears throat> the fire department can put to the fire advisory board who they would like to see as the fire chief and assistant chief once those um suggestions are made to the advisory board, the person that are interested have to go through and present a packet to the advisory board that outlines this, that they have all the requirements to be chief or all the requirements to be assistant chief. And um, 
then the fire advisory board will look at those and will say, okay, um, <clears throat> they'll either be review the documentation and they get to take one of five actions. They'll either um, submit it to the town manager with their recommendation. They'll return the package back to the applicant for additional information. They'll submit an additional, maybe they don't feel any that the quality, that the candidate that the got people at the fire department, the volunteers put forward, they can submit their own additional candidate for consideration. Um, they can also grant and deny any exemptions, like maybe somebody hasn't had, you know, ICS 800, and they could say, okay, we're going to put you forward, but you need to have ICS 800 within eight months, or we can, you know, try to remove you for cause. Um, so basically what's going to happen at this juncture, um, <clears throat> because the interim fire chief uh, obviously is Gary Kugler, um, he will be submitting a letter soon stating that he's going to be um, stepping down at the beginning of December. You're all aware of Gary's health issues and they haven't gotten any better. So um, the fire advisory board, the minutes are in here, are going to put forward two candidates for chief and assistant chief. Um, I'm going to meet with those candidates, uh, meet with, see what the fire advisory board had to say, and then um, those appointments would be made on an interim basis until February. Then the department will, um, you know, make recommendations to the fire advisory board. We'll kind of start fresh. The officers, um, other than assistant, will be basically appointments for the duration. Once you become a captain or a lieutenant, you will stay a captain or lieutenant. You will get a review every two years. You can be removed for cause, just like because they have to adhere to the Bethel personnel policy. Um, or if they leave or move on, whatever. Uh, there will be an opening, um, and I personally plan on, at this juncture, plan on leaving it open uh, for, for a little bit. I think it, there's a lot of, uh, everybody needs to settle into a role. Gary had come and really has done a tremendous job getting everybody on track with SOGs and all this, and there's 40 more SOGs to come. So um, he's really, you know, done a, Tremendous job, and uh, so I'd like to. He had used this this uh, process in Alabama, and I think it made a lot of sense. Leave a, a lieutenant or whatever position open, then it kind of gives people they can see they have somewhere to grow to. They, have, you know, you have people that have taken firefighter one. Maybe they want to take firefighter two. You know, what else are they willing? And if it's always the same people every single year, there's there's no place for them to go or grow. So, um, but if you have that and you kind of get the spot <clears throat> open, who handles the responsibility for that position? Well, it'll be the, I think there's currently a captain and a lieutenant, so you will have one of each currently. Okay. Um, because they each have a role. Yeah. And one of them mm -hmm. is not there. Yeah. Because you have an assistant chief who will be uh, stepping down um, as of December 1st, currently, uh, Greg Timmons. I spoke to him today. Um, you know, he, he, he took a great job, an opportunity for him, and it's, it's just, it's a lot. So um, anyway, so that's how, you know, so the shift will happen and, it will, and there will be some positions available. So um, the good news is that the statute is very clear about this. It's the town manager's responsibility to appoint. That's how come I appointed Gary. Um, we haven't done that in the past, but uh, we will be following this process moving forward. So um, Gary had wrote this um, and, so and I had edited it. Uh, input or no. Or no. You know, the advisory board will make their, you know, put their candidates forward, and and um, I'll either approve them or not. But by statute, that is my right, and that's how we worked it with them. So that that way they have, uh, the appointees have some place to go, and the guidelines are now here, so it's very clear on who is qualified to be chief and who is not. Because as you can see by this, there's a lot of educational, you know, stuff that needs to happen. So, um, so as in the past with all the other SOGs, uh, was just mode made a note here that I was really just looking for a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. All right.
And we, we're going to have a continuing uh, discussion on the, we brought up last time about the potential of a 1% local option tax on meals and alcohol sales rooms. Um, for review, we were chatting about it last time. I think I had brought up about um, some data that I'd seen in the past, and Therese was lucky enough to find it and put it in your packet for you, which mm -hmm. it was a uh, zip code survey that was done a couple of years ago that, um, at, that t at that time, anyways, um, was a snapshot of, you know, who inside Bethel purchases locally and who doesn't. Um, I'm sure it's not perfect, but it at least gives a, a good snapshot. So um, looking at that anyways, there was, yeah, it was uh, according to that, it was 40% um, of individuals um, purchase um, from Bethel purchase in Bethel. So, um, so there's roughly 60% of people that are either from the immediate surrounding area or out of state, as Jordan had commented earlier, there's there was less than 10% of people from out of state that has been recognized that that purchase here in Bethel. So, so the 40% that's here in Bethel, it, it sounds like about 50% of the, the remainder are people from immediate towns like, you know, um, Barnard, Randolph, South Royalton, Rochester, you know, that, that come into the town to purchase goods um, or services. So. And I think, too, I mean, this states right here that it was over a week-long period. Nine businesses participated, recorded 566 customers from 72 unique zip codes and, and 10 states. So, you know, it wasn't during foliage, um, but so it was a right. snapshot in time Winter. for a week. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was not in the winter. I yeah, mean, it was I, not in the winter. I mean, I would almost willing to bet that if you did it over the course of a year that there would probably be less than... 40% people in Bethel that purchase goods in Bethel. I think you'd see that that would grow, especially as you hit some of those peak tourism times of the year. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, like I said, it was meals and rooms. Um, Sales, I uh, had use but not use alcohol because um, this the numbers I gave you were do not include the sale of alcoholic beverages as that data is not reported by the state of Vermont for towns with less than 10 businesses reporting meals tax. So and and this is also I did not have 2023 data for sales. So the cannabis shop was not open when this was done. Um, so. There's, you know, so my uh, revenue projection of 80,000, um, you know, doesn't include the cannabis shop. Certainly, if the other cannabis shop is going to open um, in 2025, doesn't include that. So, and it doesn't include alcohol sales. So, again, I, you know, so this is easy. You, you put it on the warning, gets voted in, then we notify the state of Vermont. It goes into effect in July. Uh, the state of Vermont co um, collects the money, and then they send us the checks. Um, it is misleading that they say that we get a 1% because the state keeps 30%. <laughs> we get 70% of 1% minus $5.96 per um, return that's filed, so I also did some calculations there. But if the estimate is is you know in the ballpark, then eighty thousand, I think it would be a great funding mechanism for capital equipment and for the highway and ca and fire apparatus. I mean, it, things are not getting any cheaper. So it would be instead of going into the general fund where we can't really. You know, it would just go in as another income. I think it would be nice to use as a funding source, um, not the sole funding source, but it would help offset. It would reduce taxes because if you were able to put through forty thousand um, dollars, it would be less that we'd be appropriating right out of the tax budget. That'd be able to go. Well, that and the transfer station. How many more years do we have on that? We have a couple more years on the transfer station. So yeah, as Chris likes to remind us, there's fifty grand that we're not going to see that we currently are taking in as a general fund revenue. So I feel like it might be a, again, this is my opinion, it might be a better sell 
to the voters to say, you know, this is what it's going for. And then it's, the, and only, you know, 40% of it may be coming from you. The other percent is coming from other towns that come by, you know, we can't can't have a toll, <laughs> so, um, and, and two, like I said, I have no projections on cannabis, how much that store has done, or, you know, at a second one, you know, we don't have the opportunity to raise a lot of non-tax, non-property tax income. So while, yes, this is tax, it's, um, I think it's feasible. I think I might have asked already about Airbnbs. That would be under, yep, rooms, yep. <coughs> Assuming that they Assuming, identify as one and yeah, do so the appropriate how paperwork. Do you, how do you collect that? That would be, they would have to, um, they pay through, generally if you use uh, Airbnb or VRBO, uh, Airbnb and VRBO collect and pay to the state. But if it's somebody who's just doing it on their own without going through Well, we would have to do a mail, kind of just, we'd have to notify people that if you have an Airbnb, in town, a there's zoning regs, and b there is um, you know there's a tax that they'll have to pay to the state, so an additional tax that they'll have to pay to the state. So, and that one percent would be collected and <clears throat> registered. Yes. Yep. And so when they and, and the proprietor of the business would have to do the bookkeeping. Yep. Part of the reporting. <clears throat> how much that was and getting it filed with the state. Yep, just like they do now. They would just, um, you know, if their cash register is set to charge 6%, they'd charge 7%. And they would, yeah, when they file it with the state, um, the state would know, you know, that Bethel obviously is, is um, a 1% town and we would get our share of the money if they pay quarterly or how it works. But, um, but the lady at the state that I spoke with said, you know, if you pass it in March, it takes effect July 1, which is perfect because it runs our fiscal year. So, um, you know, we talk about you things. Heard anything that, from the local I haven't asked anybody. I mean, what's. Well, I mean, the other thing is, too, is I really, do you really think that 1%? 1% on a, on a soda, pack of cigarettes, or candy bar, or a drink, or a pizza is going to stop anyone. If they have to do additional. Oh, I, and I don't believe that, I mean, they already have to report sales and use to the state, yeah. so. Yeah, percent eh. on there. Yeah, so I don't, this isn't a big deal. It's just more money that they're reporting than because they already have to pay. They either do, they're either quarterly filers, <coughs> quarterly filers or like semi-annual, or month, they could be monthly or quarterly, excuse me. So, um, but no, it's, you know, something to think about. Like I said, it would go on the warning. It's not, the only decision we made is if you wanted to go on the warning or not. So, it's not like you guys institute it and then have the wrath. <laughs> The voters will decide at the end. They come out sometimes. So, anyways, that's the data that I have and that Chris had asked for. And was there any more data that anybody else thinks we might have or wants? Or no, it might be good if we could get some projection numbers of the cannabis and whatnot to have. Yeah, I can. I can. At that point, I can try the cannabis um, the board and see if they know. As part of the package. Okay, I can. I, mean, ask I think them. if you, if you have to, as a community, if you have to find a additional revenue service, right? You always want to try to find a revenue service that your taxpayers are not paying 100 percent of, right? So, like, that's why you have things like gas tax and things like that, because there's other other people other than your immediate state or your immediate citizens that that pay some of that burden right so it's not a hundred percent tax however on the other end of it is if you're always looking for new revenue you know even though let's say 40 percent of bethel residents do shop in bethel that's extra revenue that then becomes spent right so i mean you're just kind of instead of maybe looking at some of the issues that you may have of maybe we just need to tighten our belt a little bit we're just going to raise the bar, meaning, okay, we get $80,000, so our budget moves up $80,000, you know? Yeah. And it just becomes a vicious cycle of 
more, 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 rather than let's see, is this stuff really needed or do we need to cut back or do we need to re-examine that? And I, 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 I think it's a great option to look at. I think, you know, maybe once we get our budget put together and we've really had that discussion of, you know, do we really need that extra revenue? You know, I mean, if we look at it and say, geez, we've really scrapped everything out of here and it's still going to go up, like maybe for a long term thing, we do need to look at that. Or, or are there things in the budget that we really can say, do we really need to have that in there or can we get by? Because it's just, yeah, you know how it is, 1% turns into, you know, well, yeah. down the road they say, oh, you want to go 2%, you know? And this idea was also brought to us by a resident of Bethel. It's mm -hmm. nothing that the select board, you know, had a little powwow about. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, at least one resident has brought it to our attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, too, that's why I think if it goes to the capital fund, because, I mean, you know, the price of the old steel went through the roof after COVID, and it's not coming down. Obviously, we're looking at a loader. We've talked about the grader. Um, you know, we need to build a new town garage, you know, which, off the top of my head, that's probably looking at a $1.2 million price tag. It seems like you can't get anything for under a million these days. So, if we could find, you know, have this coming in to help offset some capital appropriations, then it, you know, I mean, I feel like we run a fairly tight I budget. I think we'll find this year. We're, we're kind of getting to the end. We kind of get to the point where people are really starting to hurt. Mm -hmm. you know, they're really starting to complain about additional taxation and cost of this, cost of that. It's true. Um, and really, especially with the aging demographic that we have in town, mm -hmm. the you know, Medicare, uh, Social Security is going up 2.5 and, Med and Medicare is probably going to go up the same. So right. The neutral it's a walk. Yeah. Tax plans are going up, prescription plans are going up, all the things that hit seniors are going up. Yeah. And I think I hear out on, on the street that just people are getting sure. the point, the saturation point. I think you could also see that, the change in the vote in the legislature, you know, legislators this year, yeah. that it was definitely a change in the demographic of who was elected this year in Vermont. Um, and I think that was part of it. I put a notice out today on Front Porch Forum reminding people that property taxes are due this Friday. Ooh. Property taxes. <laughs> so, but I also put with it a message about GMP that if you're, you know, that there is a program that they're running and um, right now for, you know, if you qualify for some electric assistance and that sort of thing. And we do try to do that. I mean, we put those out whenever we find out about them and we have people come in we sit down with them and fill out applications and we'll mail them or fax them you know for them and and um but you're right i think it's i think we always kind of do a good job of looking at what's you know not extra i mean we certainly run on a tight budget and yep. with not a lot of staff so yep. But anyway, so so as long as no more data, I guess we'll take a peek at the budget, and then um, I'll see if I can find revenue numbers for cannabis um, operation. Is it possible to get up to liquor sales too? No, no. She already told me that I can't because they don't report to the state for under ten businesses. Uh, that um, says it on the spreadsheet. Her explanation that she gave me. Um, so nobody keeps track of that data? Like they, it's just a wild frontier if you're under 10 no, businesses? No, apparently they just <laughs> like, don't like, divvy it up for towns that are under 10 reporting businesses. They obviously... I mean, you think it would be as easy as yeah, click a button on a spreadsheet yeah, and no, I, there's the town of Bethel. I like, spoke to her directly because she gave me the spreadsheet with all the other information on it. It says data is not reported by the state for towns with less than 10 businesses reporting meals tax. So I probably can I can write to her about cannabis, but them their rules. You know how that goes. If it's not reported, it's probably not recorded either. You know, they but, probably have no idea what it is. Well, well I'm sure they, and they and babes and but they have it in meals. They just don't have the alcohol yeah. uh, separate. So yeah. I don't. Know, I can only tell you what the state of Vermont gives me. So could you could you somehow get like a an approximate from each one of those identities? Like how much do you sell in liquor a year? Like if you Maybe. went if you went to Babes and said how much 
I mean, theirs is probably what? I mean, it's got to be Owen. 80, 90 percent liquor I sales, right? If it makes it, if it came to you know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's, no, that's, I don't know. If I could try. try, but I'm not sure I can get that. But um, really, they would be the bigger one. Tozers. Or is there, I mean, there's got to be some kind of mechanism Listen, you can um, look up. You can up, call like, the lady at the state. I'll give you her email address. I'm telling no, you what she told me. <laughs> but me. yeah, I don't know. So that yeah. this is the information I have. I can certainly dig around and see if there's anybody else who has more information. Um, and. But like I said, what we had come up with was a conservative estimate. They don't care about they don't care about you know less than ten liquor licenses, but they'll care about every damn person that rides the bus, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> and do we need to change a route or not? You know, what I mean, does that sound like you know? That like, sounds like on. Vermont. It's, that's, that's that's what ridiculous. it sounds like. You would think of anything, liquor and tobacco and marijuana and those things would be so tightly scrutinized. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying every penny that they every know town what it is. They know. They're just like, they just crazy. don't. They're they know what the answers are. They just don't provide them to towns. So those are their rules. Huh. But I'll dig around, see what I can find. Um, it's about yet. time we haul Kurt back in here. I mean, we can put that on his <laughs> list of things to do. We want to we know what the Kirk's, town of Bethel's liquor is. Kirk's coming to the next meeting, um, member, because you're doing your. Uh, Bet you we could get it pretty quick. I doubt. Either I don't you know. tell us, or we'll make it a dry town. <laughs> <Okay>. Overnight. <laughs> uh, there you can. go. And make it so that all you do is rubber stamp those now. We don't even get to see the permit we anymore. The anymore. We used to have a permit. Now we don't even see a permit. Yeah. yeah. It's like cannabis, if they're doing where they grow, we can't even, I can't even give that information to the select board because the address of where the operation is, is protected. So I can't, I could just say, you know, and they give us like 20 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever the permit, but they have to do all the approval and the person filling out the app, the swears they adhere to our zoning and swears they do something else. And that's it. I can't even release the information to the board because it would go out in a packet because it's not public record. I, I assume it's for their safety, right? So someone's not, you know, coming up and harassing them, but it's a, it's a thing. Hmm. Not like you can't find those things out, though, you know. I don't know. We'll see. Follow Why your nose. I've got to dig around and see what I know what the state is trying to find out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right. Anything further on the local option tax discussion? We'll, just, we'll keep talking about that on and off through the budget season. <clears throat> All right. Uh, equipment committee's recommendation to purchase a loader. Yep, so this is a Komatsu loader. Uh, we're using the capital equipment money per the equipment schedule. This includes an additional bucket, which termed a snow bucket. Uh, it has a five-year warranty, which it comes with, and it also is going to come with a five-year Komatsu care maintenance. So, which is really nice is that they're going to, they will do the maintenance. So they can't come in and say, oh, you did, you did what? Oh, you voided your warranty. So that's not, so that's a good thing. We have a Komatsu now. They're actually obvious Komatsu is giving us the best price on trade. Uh, AJ looked at a John Deere, a Cat, a Komatsu, and a Volvo. And he actually went and looked at, and Volvo was just out of our price range. AJ went and looked at all three of these, um, recommended the Komatsu. Um, we've had a Komatsu for 15 years with no real issues. So the, I had spoken with Jeff Gilman and then Ray Blakeney, Ryan Slack, AJ and I were present for the um, meeting. So what we're coming up with here is 199.300. Um, and it said in their offer, or in their, excuse me, not offer, in their quote, that we could ask about adding an Anderson extended warranty, but the gentleman is still trying to come to some numbers. So what I was asking for is a motion to authorize town manager to spend up to 219, um, because I don't know yet what that extended warranty is gonna come in at. Um, and right now I'm at 199.3, so obviously, you know, there's a little wiggle room there. And then we can get it ordered and move on. What's, what's the turnaround time? 
I actually, I think it's going to be like six weeks, so not not bad. Actually, we were surprised. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you know the, the length of that extended board? Uh, What's covered? Five years, like I said, and um, I don't know the terms. Uh, four years. I know, like I said, is the gentleman is we're waiting for him to get back to us because currently we get the five-year, 4,000-hour warranty and we're going to get a five-year care maintenance plan so they come and do the maintenance. And that's the 193. Yes. Right. And so what I'm, 199.3, so what I'm waiting for is to see if they're, because we held our Komatsu for 15 years, is what is the price of this extended Anderson warranty. And it may just be five years. I don't know. <clears throat> um, so, anyway, like we've talked about in the past, we, we have to buy extended warranties now. It just, there's so many things that we can't fix. You know, pretty soon we're not going to need mechanics, we're just going to need computer operators to come in and deal with them. So, um, so we're doing, taking the same process that we've taken before. So AJ had evaluated them, the equipment committee was unanimous in their recommendation. Um, you know, Jeff and Ryan are always good about these things, as Jeff was like, you know, we heard really good things about the, about the uh, Volvo, but we're like, yeah, we just can't swing it. And nobody on the equipment committee wanted another John Deere after the whole greater escapade and um, that service. So we knew we were going to steer away from that. And then there was some comments, I guess, Jeff had about the cat and some concerns. So they were all uh, legitimately saying, go with a Komatsu. It seems like it's one piece of equipment we own that we haven't had a problem with. <laughs> so I'm like, just don't, so let's keep getting them. <clears throat> so that is the recommendation. And how does this look um, in regards to our equipment fund? Perfect. We have budgeted 219, and we're currently under that. So and we'll hopefully, we'll find out what the warranty, hopefully this week, um, but we won't be going over the 219, so it keeps us where we need to be. And I'll make a motion to authorize the town manager to spend up to $219,000 for the new loader. Hey, I asked you guys if you wanted to be on the equipment committee, and you all said no. So. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Okay. Right. Can you go with the electric version? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd get us down Sand Hill and back, probably. <laughs> be charging it at Denise's charging house. <laughs> I'll keep the extension. Yeah. The charger yeah. here is open all the time. Yeah. Plug it in true. wherever you want. That's right. Four days later. Do we have, not even mentioned that, is there an update on the new charger? We've received um, two dollars and I think thirty-four cents, and that was just Josh Wardell charging it after he plugged it in to make sure it worked. Yeah, I haven't seen any notices coming. Straight out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's no, winter. Not a soul. I don't not see sold. signs out there like you see along the highway about EV chargers. <clears throat> yeah, they'll have to do. They have to put one on the parking lot. Not here. Tell anybody it's there. Right. They'll have to do a little more of a push, and um, there's a sign on it, and that's it. So, but doesn't they had agreed to do that? Uh, no, I don't have. Oh, electric, they, I don't yeah, have an electric vehicle, but yeah. Once that gets uploaded, that's supposed to go into the database. So yep. if you have an electric vehicle and you're looking for the nearest place, that that should show up on on, on the, the GPS something. navigation, I believe. Yeah, it is actually. They mentioned there's uh, an app, so I'll ask Josh if our charger is on the app. <laughs> Yeah, that's the state. I don't know. Why did they put bathroom? 40 level ones down there at the interstate nobody uses? <laughs> you know. So we'll, I'll ask Josh Wardell Energy about it if, if we're up on the app yet. We, yeah, or however it is to make sure it's advertised at least. Mm -hmm. I he could seen put something on Facebook and front porch form. use it yet. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll reach out to, to Josh and Vander and uh, see mm -hmm. what they know. Okay. Great. Okay. And town meeting or town manager's report. Is that right? Find it. I don't remember seeing it in there. To be honest with you. Yeah, I, feel like I wrote one. 
It's on the back Actually, of the On the back of yours. Oh, okay, no. Mine's mis committee. Mine's misfiled. Okay. On the back which one? Yep. Which one? Is it on the back of yours? It's on the back of the oh, rec committee. It's in there somewhere. The Mine rec was committee? In the, back. the back of the rec committee. I don't know. I didn't make the pack. I made the pack. Kelly was oh, on a copy. Gotcha. Yeah. So good news. Excellent news. The July 2023 flood which was bad news, but financially, what has happened is the, we have hit the threshold that the federal government has, so we've hit the 90-10 threshold. So FEMA will now be paying 90% of the July 2023 disaster, the state of Vermont will pay 7.8%, and we will only be on the hook for 2.2%. Um, I ran the numbers, and in my estimation, we've paid 100% of our 12.5% ERAF for Pinello Bridge based on a $1.4 million project. So if it comes in under 1.4, good. If it's over 1.4, we're going to owe a little bit more money. Um, we will finish paying our 2.2% July, the ERAF, which is... I can't remember the term, but it's basically our share. I can't remember what ERAF stands for. It's a long... I can't remember what the what it's about. Anywho, it's our portion. So we will finish paying our 2.2% of the July ERAF of 29,792 basically with our with the budget we're in now. So I'm estimating that our December 2023 flood damage to be about 1.56 million. And that is because of that culvert on Sugar Hill. So I've got, I've had a 60% design meeting and so I haven't seen any real engineer's cost of construction. So I'm hoping I'm high on that, but we'll see. That would be, Still at the 12.5% ERAF, so we would be responsible for about 195,000. Um, we will be paying for a portion of that out of the budget we're in this minute, the 24-25, leaving us with about 110,600 to pay, which we could split over two years. So, but again, that's that's you know, so it's Pinellos paid off. And, the, and so is, you know, July. So it's really just going to be about what the final cost is for the Sugar Hill, you know, uh, culvert replacement. So but the state of Vermont apparently has a big thing against big culvert. So it's probably going to end up being a small bridge. But um, anyway, so I have the lawyer was here. So I'm working on we're going to need like two or three easements in that area. So um, from Mr. Gothier, who I spoke to him about it. And then um, there's a couple other people that will need an easement. But it's actually going to shift it kind of more into our right away a little more upstream. So Mr. Gothier, uh, Robert was very happy to hear that. So um, obviously we're paving, finally. Uh, Sand Hill, they started fine grading today. Um, Pike is doing Sand Hill, Bicentennial, and a portion of the road to the reservoir. Fresh Coat Paving is also here. Uh, they are paving Babe's parking lot, the trench cuts, trench patches on Crystal Drive and across the road on Royalton Hill Road. And then they're going to do some work for the town, but for AJ, uh, for the town doing a little bit of North Road. So paving, paving everywhere. So that'll be, it's all good news. Um, so there is, on Thursday, there is a problem with the stormwater project, with no, not stormwater project, with the water project. We have been waiting because Geico has been offline. As you know, we're supposed to rebuild that whole building and we were gonna pull the pump and put in a new wellhead and, well, I found out on Thursday that there was a miscommunication, I don't know what happened, somebody dropped the ball between Hebert's and Minash and nobody ordered the wellhead. That's three, four months out. So, Richard, in his infinite wisdom, is also is currently getting a price on a submersible pump because that may be around the same ballpark and we won't need the wellhead for that. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen there um, because we bought that 
whatever booster thing for about 10 grand, which we thought was part of the problem, but it's actually the problem is part of the pump. So we have an estimate of about 20,000 to pull it and repair the pump. Um, it, the engineers have talked to the state for the drinking water, and we, we able to, we'll be able to put some of this work into the loan. We're not gonna have to come up with 20 grand to upgrade it. If we end up going with a different motor and we do a submersible at Geico, yes, we have you know the existing pump and possibly a backup, but those would be able to be used at Peavine. So it's not like, you know, so we'll have some backup there, some redundancy. But this is not ideal situation. I am not happy about it. Richard's not happy about it. The engineers aren't happy about it. So, you know, we're just waiting for some more information because the contractor says he has documentation going back since the spring with Minash saying that this was all said and they were gonna do this work and, and that never happened. So I don't know. I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter to me who did what to whom. Bottom line is, I got it, it is what it is, and we've got to see what we're going to do. So we're either going to have to hold off. But meanwhile, that pump's been offline a while, which is putting more pressure on on Bevine. So I don't know. I you know, there's no answer for you right now. We're going to figure it out. We're waiting for the price on the submersible. Um, so how how long would it be to get the the other? We He's don't. In. I the wellhead will be at least three months because it's it's custom made, so it'll be at least three, possibly four months. Um, I don't know. We should. Richard is hoping to have pricing on the submersible pump and to find out what the lead time is on that. So at this point, we're kind of in limbo, or not kind of. We are in limbo. Um, is that something that you can install in February in yeah. Vermont? Or? Yep. What they said, we can still tear down the pump station and you know they said if if we they would obviously have to use blankets and heat and for the concrete and this and that but I don't know what's gonna happen at this point we may it depends we could have Minaj come in there is a hatch in the roof so we can pull the pump we may just have to do the pump work either with the one we want or put in a submersible and then let Hebert finish the construction of the actual well house in the spring. I don't know. And there's still no progress on Crystal Drive. Um, booster pump station, supposedly their Hebert is waiting on someone to come in and do the spray foam. And maybe they can just clean up around there. There's a lot of debris just. Well, if you went up there today, it's even a bigger mess because they had dump trucks, <laughs> paving trucks, and so I think you'll see some of that clean up. The, the sliding, box oh, sliding, yeah, because they're not all sorts of stuff just laying around. Yep, and, and they're not yeah done yet. And the door, supposedly, the door has arrived, but I'll believe that when I see it installed. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, they're over their contract date. So now we are. Yeah. <laughs> waiting, they, they're over the contract date. Um, of course, you know, we could enforce liquidated damages, but it just, I'm just waiting to see what's gonna happen. Now, the, the current issue is Aldrich and Elliott, we pay them for construction oversight, and they're pretty much gonna be out of money, and I have refused for months to pay. I said, when you're done, you're done. Then I said to Jimmy, he I said, get your checkbook out, because I am not paying you paying for them to finish you're the one dragging on you're the one mm -mm. nope not me so he's well aware of that Aldrich and Elliot is well aware of that that was like no way so I'm not giving them an ad dime so they'll have to you know so he's got to work that out I didn't make the project late so I'm not paying for any more construction oversight you know, Hebert's gonna have to. So I would rather do that than try to do liquidated damages because the minute you do liquidated damages, we're both in court and this, that, and the other, right? Last time for a long time. I have, you know, we're just gonna see what happens moving forward. So I will have another update in a couple weeks. In the meantime, a lot of deep breathing and waiting for some prices from Minaj to see what's gonna happen. So I had a conversation with Jimmy um, when I was off on Thursday, so he's well aware of the situation and our feelings about that, and, and um, it's certainly been well documented that I'm done writing checks for over construction oversight, so we'll see what happens. So, you know, that's a cluster, but...
What are you going to do? The other thing is, I said, and we should keep talking about the town-wide reappraisal at every meeting. So when the town, when we have all the um, properties are appraised, Everybody will get the big newspaper that tells you how much, you know, what your property value is and, and you'll have the right to, you know, there's a process to grieve and ask questions and all that. But the key thing is when the tax bills come out in July of 2025, they will be, the tax will be based on the assessed value of the property that Nemrick has just done on the two-year rolling reappraisal. However, if you get a prebate, a reduction in your taxes from the state, everybody knows what the prebate is, right? That's going to be based on the value of your vehicle, a vehicle, previous, the value of your home from the prior year. So people are going to call and they're going to say, my taxes went up 1300 bucks. And we're going to say, actually, your taxes went up $300, but you received less, $1,000 less of a prebate. So we are going to be crafting something to put in with the tax bill in July to kind of let people know that we're going to put something in the March town report and we're going to talk about it, you know, tell your friends. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's going to be this one year that's, you know, I've, Obviously, the tax, just because your property value went up, you know, hopefully the tax rate comes down because there's some growth in the grand list. But just so people know that what happens that one year uh, will change the following year because the following year your property value uh, prebate will be based on the current value. So it's very difficult to explain this, especially to people who don't understand, you know, the prebate. I, mean, I talk to people who get a prebate and they don't know where the money comes from. So it's a... So on April 1st, when the snapshot is taken, <clears throat> are all the properties going to have been reappraised? Yes. At that point? Yep. Commercial and mm -hmm. residential? Yep. So every, there won't be half the people getting it? No, 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 no. Nope. That's why they do a two-year. Nope. And they're actually done. Um, they were just going around uh, a few weeks ago looking at current sales to say, okay, this is where our land schedule is. Say, say Bethel's a $40,000 is their base, you know, per acreage. Okay. If, it, if it's going to go up, hasn't been raised in 15 years. If it goes to 60,000 for the lot, they're kind of trying to see if under their new taunt, under their new framework of estimating land values, et cetera, can they get to the sale of those properties? So they said that they had one um, that they couldn't. They were like, huh. So somebody bought, you know, maybe they just really wanted it. Maybe they got in a bidding war. I don't really know. But they said every other property that they had looked at, they had been able to get to the price that was paid. So that's one thing that they're doing is going around now and confirming recent sales. So it's going to be confusing to explain this to folks, uh, especially if they don't do their own taxes. Um, if they don't get a prebate, obviously they don't care, but some people, um, that seems to be the common terminology is prebate, um, but we'll look at the tax bill, see what they call it, and try to put a um, kind of elemental level explanation of what's happening. So, because I know people are gonna, you know, get a little upset when they first see it, so they gotta kind of see the balance. So, with the state of Vermont, we're, we're not affected. Our, our, we still get the money we're supposed to get to pay our bills. Yep. I, yeah. So, the state of Vermont is gonna give out less prebate money. Right. They are. For one year. For, For one year. year. Yeah. yeah. Because of the way that it works. Big one in all the towns, all the towns that are having that are having reappraisals. Is it the whole year, or is it like? Because it sounds like the confusion is that like in January is when this like prebate or whatever starts. So is it from July till January that the, it's going to be? Uh, or is it like? Well, each. July? It, it's July a fiscal year. It's July to June, so it's each fiscal year. But what happens is when you file your taxes in April, obviously it's based on the value of your property. When you fill out the form, uh, say, you're, say you're really good and you do your taxes in January, and um, when you send in the information to the state, 
they ask you to take your span number and some information right off your tax bill and that value is okay gotcha yeah that's the value whereas when you get your tax bill that value will be different so for a year mm -hmm, yeah so for that yep for the whole year so the following you know, year when you go to do your taxes, it'll write it'll write itself out. But that year, the prepaid is income based. It is. It's mm -hmm. it's amount of the income based on the portion of your yeah income to tax ratio. So the good news. So bad news stinks for a year. <clears throat> Going to cost you some money. The following year, it could. It, you know, will obviously could be more than people have seen in the past because if their income is still the same and the value of their property's gone up, then their prebate's gonna grow. So, but we feel, I feel specifically, that we need to educate people about this because, you know, people can- that out soon? We've been talking, we've been talking because, about it. You know, the, because it is income-based, the lower the income, the bigger, Rebate, rebate. Right, but once you're 1099, it's... All of a sudden, people who are on, you know, fixed income, right. blindsided, and uh -huh. they're already... Yeah. They get blindsided by having to kick in another thousand... Exactly. Whatever. I know. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about it for, for a while. It's definitely going to make some people... Yeah, people are going to call the office and probably not in the friendliest manner. Um, but can the, can the state do something about that? Is there some kind of I doubt it. You know, not that no. I mean, Nemrick didn't mention. It. I doubt it because they've got multiple towns, and now the state has you know stuck their nose in the reappraisal I mean, business. The, <clears throat> they're I mean, requiring the only thing the town, towns every six or seven years to get a reappraisal. So the only thing the state could potentially do if they wanted to is. On the on the next taxes after that, they could give you a credit. You know, like oh right. You know what I mean? So if, yeah. if this time around, I'm just making up. This time around, you had to pay an extra yeah. thousand because of because the system is always a year behind, right? Yeah. Then when you do your so let's say, and then when you do your taxes in two thousand twenty six, they you know they could save that money right <laughs> and, and then they could offer that back to you were you drinking i mean like, we know that's not going to happen here because they can't even <laughs> keep track of <laughs> liquor <laughs> numbers and less than 10 but yeah um, so i mean they could in theory bank yeah. it and give it back to people if they wanted to but yeah so it's definitely something that we need to craft mm. and get you know in the newspaper and get out we've been talking about a select board meetings and um <clears throat> but it, it's honestly it's the time to sit down and really look at how to break this down and explain it well to folks um so that you know they're not super confused about it but um it's definitely something that could be at, i mean it's nothing i thought it, again about. we 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 are due to have kurt come in i mean it's definitely something that could be taken up to the legislator saying do you guys understand that there is this issue mm -hmm. of this one year sure. gap they, they that you have uh -huh. and you know Right because now, spend that money. Yeah. so you know, I mean, maybe they'll run up there and say, "Woo, we got a bunch of money coming," you know. But yeah, uh, but there is an opportunity for them to try to figure something out there with some kind of yeah, rebate they, or something that they, they could do. They've or, already cracked this code because the state was the ones who, right when we signed the contract with Nemrick, that we're starting. They're forcing <coughs> towns now to do reappraisal, and then apparently they're vetting companies and like they're not in control of enough they're doing yeah. this so they obviously know the answer well, and maybe they're banking on it maybe they're writing their budgets going all right we got 15 towns doing a reappraisal there's extra money i don't know but we certainly um you know so it'll come out in july so uh but yes we're town report and everything else we just need to take the time to kind of figure out how to spell this out i should actually ask randolph what they did because um, they just had a reappraisal. Police department to handle it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably. So uh, let's see. So tomorrow I have our VOSHA hearing to um, challenge my eleven thousand dollar bill from two violations. So rumor has it that they can drop it. Like what was the violations that they gave us? One. I mean, and, and just from being a contractor, they sound kind of excessive. Like, 
a VOSHA violation is normally, you well, know, I mean, as long as it's not a, and there's few that are very severities, yeah. but normally they're, you know, a thousand dollars or five thousand at the most. I've never heard of eleven thousand dollars. Well, uh, too, and, and I will say this, you know, been doing this gig for 20 years. I've never had a VOSHA inspection. The guy was awesome, super nice, very informative, uh, very informational. So one of them was an eyewash station that we did not have enough eyewash solution to run for a continuous 15 minute stream. 5,500 bucks. Um, it the, just sounds excessive. The other one was we had an eyewash station, but so, that's fine, but he also made a suggestion. Um, there was. And one, where was that located at? That was at the sewer plant. Sewer plant. And there was a, an, a Tim had had an old one that kind of came from your sink. So the gentleman pointed it out to Richard and talked about it. And Richard, like within two days, had it replaced. So now it's part of the sink, and it obviously has water. You have more than 15 minutes. So that was you know taken care of right there. Then the other one was. I apologize, I'm not a welder. Flash arresters, um, AJ didn't even know, and Morgan, we weren't sure what they were. Spark arresters. Yeah, something that came in the host. So yeah. that was fine. We, AJ contacted the company immediately, and that was remediated. Um, he saw a couple of things that he mentioned to us about safety. Like, here's a crazy one. You can have a propane tank inside the town garage if it's hooked to something, like a heater top or something. But if it's just sitting there, it can't be inside the garage. Okay. Um, so he was very good about that. The, um, the sewer plant, we did not have a boat or a life preserver. I thought he, I was, I thought he was joking me because we're walking around. He goes, where's your boat? And I'm like, what am I going to do? Get him a kayak? And he's like, no, seriously. I'm like, oh God. I'm like, what? So we had to buy a throw ring so that if, you know, somebody was there other than Richard that fell in, he could toss them the ring. And um, they didn't fine us for that. We had no idea. Even though the gate's there, when Richard is working, as was Tim, you, you didn't lock the gate behind you. So by rights, somebody could meander in and fall in. I mean, Richard and Tim always did the same thing, which was if they were doing work, they have someone from the road crew come in and make sure they're safe. And, you know, you could stand up because, you know, <laughs> not every head climb out. But he did say that while OSHA recommends a boat, he talked to his supervisor and they said, since it's only either just Clayton or just Richard, there's obviously no one to throw you the boat. <laughs> so they were gonna let us go with that for now. And uh, they didn't have a recommendation on, they didn't have, yeah, floaties. They didn't have a recommendation <laughs> on, a, on a boat. So I, I have to say, he was really good about things that he saw. And he, he didn't go to every location. I mean, he was very nice. He did say to me, hey, Tell Richard that if he doesn't have an eye wash station that runs for 15 minutes at both stations that he has chlorine at both pump houses, he needs to buy them. Yeah, just buy, just I said, buy eye wash. I said, do you want to go see him? And he was like, nope. So he was actually very good. I had an outlet that isn't working in the town office, so I had um, Pam's air conditioner plugged into an orange app. That's a no-no. But he didn't ding me for it. So the violations that he wrote us were just those two. And um, so, like I said, I have a meeting tomorrow via Zoom, Skype with the chief of something tomorrow at, at 9.30, I think, to, um, you know, show him that everything was remediated within the same time period that, that he came and, and uh, see if we can get the fines down. Because, again, the, 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 whole, the, the whole purpose of having a visit is really to bring things to standards if they see it, not necessarily to be punitive. <clears throat> yeah. And... Usually when they're punitive is things like someone could have died. You right. know, that is usually when they get punitive. Like mm -hmm. if they drive by and they see somebody 12 feet in a hole without a, oh, a trench, a box. trench box where <laughs> somebody could die. I mean, that is where they put the hammer down. Yeah. But normally like I wash station. I mean, that, I mean that they don't usually do that. That sounds extreme. 5,000. Yeah. 5, yeah, yeah. That yeah, just 5, sounds, you know, yes. that, ridiculous. So we'll see what happens. 
happens, but the other thing we are going to do is I can't do anything until this is part is over. Once this is over, we're going to reach out to Project WorkSafe. So you can, they'll come for free and work with us on, on policies and stuff. We were very lucky that before uh, Tim passed away, he had written a tag out policy. He'd written, uh, Dietrich had written a bloodborne pathogen. Tim had done a small confined space. Pro Thank God there was a few things that he'd done and all the SDS binders were up to date and he found a couple things at the fire station and just had Gary correct them. Um, so we will bring in Project WorkSafe because the good thing is once you have them on board, if VOSHA comes back, they can say, nope, we're working with them. These are our clients. So move on to another town. So what, what sparked <clears throat> VOSHA to come and do an audit with us to begin with? Because they don't typically do audits anywhere. Well, he said um, that municipalities, that they do all the municipalities, but the um, I had heard rumor that that VOSHA had got a little smack on the wrist because OSHA came in and said they hadn't been doing the right number of inspections. But I will also say this could be my fault because I was very adamant and publicly um, writing to everybody and their mother about dialing back the firefighter uh, VOSHA regs, which will... Then all of a sudden they show up at yeah. your door and <laughs> audience... I, I've never even heard of a... T I'm sorry, I've never even... I mean, <laughs> it was me. I've never even heard of a town ever being audited yeah. for VOSHA. Well, I... I mean, even yeah. as a contractor, VOSHA doesn't even... They, they VOSHA drives through our work zones all day, every day. They never stop unless they see somebody in a hole. I don't know. Like, they never do that. And they could so, do that, and they could find you. I mean, they could find on every job. Yeah. And they never do that. Well, it did coincidentally come shortly after yeah. my, I mean, I was trying to fight it on the state level. I put in my comments to OSHA, which you guys knew about, and we were trying, because if the VOSHA regs go through, or the OSHA regs, and VOSHA w doesn't make their own ruling, which they've never done, they always go with OSHA recommendations, that is going to cripple fire departments financially. We will have to hire someone to come in and, and do some of the stuff. So I had worked with the Vermont uh, Volunteer Firefighters Association. I may have called a bunch of people at the state. <laughs> so, and then the guy goes, oh, you're just one I wanted to see. I'm from VOSHA. I said, oh, I had this coming. <laughs> so could be me. <laughs> um, although I will say the gentleman was great and a lot of good information. AJ. Uh, Richard, myself, Morgan, and Gary. So the guy was great. So uh, they're they're normally pretty good to work with. I mean, normally. Yeah, he was great. Walked through the whole thing and uh, you know gave good advice and and uh, everybody got their stuff done like right away. So I'm you know optimistic that tomorrow will. I'd be shocked well. if they don't financially. If it's all fixed. The initial and then the yeah. I had heard that the most they could dial it back was 40%, but then someone else said they could they get rid of it, but yeah, I don't they know. Up to code. Yeah, they can toss them. It's no different than somebody issuing you a ticket for speed. You know, the, the same officer can toss the ticket or those things. I don't know. I was. If, you know. if they're adamant that, they're gonna, <laughs> that we'll have to pay for huh? it. I will. I will. So I'm going to say it could be me because well, I was. It just was very coincidental timing. If they're adamant, just tell them that we're waiting for the liquor bureau to get back to us on, yeah, right. <laughs> on how many liquor sales we had in our area. Yeah. And so, we'll pay them once we figure that out. That's right. So we have that tomorrow, a FEMA meeting on Tuesday, and I'm uh, going to try to meet with Gary this week to... Wrap up some stuff. Um, I feel like there's another meeting on there, but we'll see. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so if it was me, I'm sorry. I was trying to really save the fire department some money, but I don't know. I have to tell you, yeah. the timing was suspect. Yeah, it's, it's odd because I never hear them <laughs> going anywhere. <laughs> oh, that's, oh well. <clears throat> Whatever. We got them all fixed, so it's good to know no one was injured. Sounds targeted. <laughs> Probably my fault. <coughs> All right, so but if VOSHA makes another rule for the fire department, I'm totally helping take credit for that. <laughs> so, I may have lost 11 grand, but we could have saved more down the road. All right. So we had the um, select board meeting minutes from the 28th and 29th. On the 29th minutes. Mm -hmm. 
up the top there present. I think I was here for that one. I'm, I'm well, you were because you spoke. I'm, yeah. I'm on the list. <laughs> you showed up at six o'clock. Yeah. And down uh, toward the bottom, uh, there's a paragraph discussion of asking residents of town meeting to comment about whether they want to continue. Yep. The next line says the advisory board also feels the food shop and the library should be moved to the town budget. Now that's not what we were suggesting. Um, oh, move to. Okay. So, so move. Maybe move. we just take that move. line out of there. Should be moved, period. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, or just take that whole thing right out okay. of there. Because we were, you know, suggesting that they had to go either the petition route or yep. the... Excellent. Or whatever. Thank but you. Not, we didn't want it to move into the town budget. Thank God. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any edits on the 28th? Okay. Okay, just need a motion to approve um, the 28th as written and the 29th as amended. So moved. Okay. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and there was a few other things in there with other communications. There's also um, up to date where we're at with the budget. Yeah, sorry about that. September was, something was on my desk. So you got two, I think. Yeah, I gave you September and October, so I apologize. So. I had one on my desk. So, and any other business to come before the board? All right, well, hearing none, just need a motion to adjourn. Second. All right, well, have a good evening.